Hello everyone. Uh, nice to see everyone in uh, our Zoom meeting. Please do continue to come in, get yourselves comfortable. Uh, my name is Kelly. I'm the Alumni Engagement Manager uh, within the Development and Relations Office here at the University of Leicester. Uh, I'm really pleased that so many of my fellow alumni are able to join us this evening. Uh, so no, no matter where you are in the world, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you as you join us for our first Festival of, Ch Festival of Change event this year, Festival of Change, Freedom of Speech and Local Democracy, New Challenges and Opportunities. Remember the Hanforth Parish Council meeting. Just a few housekeeping items before we start this evening. Uh, please feel free to keep your videos on for the duration of today's event, but please keep your microphones on mute so that we can all hear Marta, our speaker. I'm sure many of you are now professionals when it comes to participating in online events, given how many we've, we have joined over the previous couple of years. But as a reminder, you can find the microphone and camera button at the bottom of your screen. Don't worry if you're struggling to meet yourself as a member of our wonderful alumni engagement team will be on uh, will be able to support you with this and turn it off on your behalf. Please do post your questions in the Q&A in the chat box and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A section towards the end of this talk. To stay in the loop with alumni news and events, please make sure that your contact details are up to date. And if you're a user of social media, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Our handle is at Leicester Alumni. If you're interested in any of the opportunities mentioned, please let us know in the event evaluation form, which will be posted here in the chat at the end of today's event. We value all feedback that we receive as it helps us to shape our events and better support our alumni community. Thank you again for joining us this evening and I hope you enjoy yourselves. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marta Mangiarulo. Over to you, Marta. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for the nice introduction. Thank you the, to the whole team for, for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very, very pleased to be able to tell you a bit about um, what I do when I'm not working at the university as a teaching fellow and research assistant. I will start by sharing my slides. Okay. Let me see. Kelly, can you tell me how everyone can see the slides? Yeah, at the moment we can see it. Yeah, oh, perfect, ready to go. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, in this talk, I would like to tell you a bit about the Speakers Corner Trust and the project we have carried out in the past and the project we are currently planning to, um, to, to carry out in, uh, in the present and in the future. So I will first start, uh, start my, my talk by telling you a bit about who is the Speakers Corner Charity, what do we do? Uh, I will highlight three projects that we have carried out in the past. Two of them I was directly involved in. And then I will conclude my talk uh, by telling you a bit about what we plan to do. And at the end of the talk, we will have plenty of time for, for questions and for a long Q&A Q &A session. So, who is the Speakers Corner Trust? We are a national charity that has three main pillars of activity. And these three main pillars are advocate, debate, and educate. The first pillar is advocating. So we aim to provide thought leadership through sponsored and grant funded research and media coverage and comment. The second pillar is debating. So we host online debates and webinars and discussions. And the third pillar is educating. So we aim to encourage local groups to explore debating and public speaking through the provision of educational resources and small grants. And I will, I will be able to tell you a bit about some uh, one of these small grants later on in the presentation. The Speakers Corner Trust was established in 2007 and broadly speaking, it is concerned with the citizens' abilities to engage in open public debate, free speech, and active citizenship. We aim to create new opportunities for people to come together to discuss their interests and priorities. And you will see in the next slide that so far we are quite a, of a small charity. 
but we have big aims. And uh, as a representation of these big aims, um, I am very proud to say that we were shortlisted for the empowerment, transparency, and democratic rights category for the 2022 Democracy Award just at the end of last year. I've just mentioned that we are a small charity. So as of today, this is um, our board of trustees. The chair and interim CEO is Luis Third, who I saw is in the call. So you, if you have any specific question that I am not able to answer to the best of my possibilities, I might be likely to uh, signpost you to, to her. And the trustees are Ewan Bater, Rosie Beacon, Stella Femivolt, uh, myself, Marta Mangiarulo, and Stephen Norton. And each of us um, provides a particular point of view to the, to the charity due to our background and due to our familiarity with different types of activities and, and stakeholders. For example, um, I will now tell you about um, the project that uh, one of the first projects, actually the first project I carried out with the, with the charity when I was a research assistant with them between the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021. Um, it was this research report aimed at understanding the impact of COVID-19 on local democracy, citizen participation and local decision making. Um, I can provide, I think either Kelly or someone else from the team might be able to post the link to the full report in the chat in case you're interested in going, in going over it in further detail. In the next slides, I will tell you a bit about what the report was and our main findings, but you are more than welcome to uh, go through the report in your own time and then get back to me or to the charity as a whole to discuss it in, in, further, in further detail. So this project aimed at understanding, as I mentioned earlier, the impact of COVID-19 on local democracy. Um, let me take you back in time to darker times, I would say. So let me take you back to March uh, 2020 to give you an idea of uh, what the situation looked like when we started thinking about these, this project. So in March, on March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic. And then uh, less than two weeks after, so at the end of March, uh, the UK government announced a near total lockdown. And if you remember, the claim was stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. In light of this background, uh, we wanted to understand how local councils in England reacted to, uh, to COVID-19, but most importantly to the lockdowns that it brought. Um, we also wanted to understand whether there would be a return to the pre-COVID-19 world of face-to-face in-person communications or whether we were going towards a mix of face-to-face -face and online communications. And we finally um, wanted to understand whether there would be a return to a traditional face-to-face -face democracy or whether uh, more advanced technological solutions be, uh, would be implemented. To be able to answer these questions, we carried out a survey and some video interviews. Um, the survey uh, was sent to, um, I think, most of city uh, most of um, English town and city councils, and we got 50 respondents. So 50 English councils took part in our survey. And we were also able to interview 16 local democracy reporters. Um, our survey and the video interviews allowed us to get an idea about each of these topics. So they allowed us to understand better the overall impact of COVID-19 on local democracy. We, also, we were also able to understand the impact on citizen research and community engagement, uh, the impact on relationships, um, we also we were also able to um, explore the problems and opportunities resulting from COVID-19, the big issue of digital in, uh, exclusion and, and inclusion. And finally, uh, we asked uh, the local democracy reporters about what they thought local democracy would look like post COVID-19. Um, in this presentation, I will mostly be focusing on the findings from the survey, but again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, feel free to go check out the report with all the findings from the survey as well as from the, the interviews. So 
the first question we asked the councils was, what do you think the impact of COVID-19 has been on local democracy? And 64% uh, percent of them um, answered that on balance. They thought it has enhanced local democracy. 32% of them um, answered that they were not sure. And uh, only 4% of them mentioned that on balance, it has compromised local democracy. We also wanted to understand this better. So the next question was, in what way do you think local democracy has been enhanced? And the respondents talked about online meetings being held in public or recordings being made publicly available. And you may remember the Hanford Parish Council meetings that were made available online and on YouTube and people were able to see what um, city council meetings uh, looked like. Um, another way in which democracy was enhanced was that councillors had the opportunity to meet online and uh, these lockdowns also gave um, more opportunities to communicate and interact online, uh, both between councillors and also between the councillors and the, and the citizens. And finally, um, the respondents also talked about higher percentage of attendance at meetings due uh, to the use of online medium. However, democracy was also compromised to some extent. So the respondents talked about some citizens disadvantaged by not having online access. So the issue uh, about uh, the digital divide. Um, they also talked about how closed council offices and public buildings um, reduced access to information and advice for the citizens. And also they talked about the restricted ability to listen and engage with citizens during the the pandemic. Another issue we wanted to explore, so we asked the participants which of the following have been positive opportunities for your council and its local community as a result of the COVID-19 lockdowns. So um, they had a list of items and these were the most chosen. So the respondents uh, talked about changed working arrangements, for example, staff being able to work from home, they talked about having council and committee meetings by video conferencing, just like the example I made in the previous slide. They talked about IT systems being improved or improved access to online platforms. And interestingly, one of the positive outcomes was that uh, the lockdowns uh, highlighted that some groups of citizens were especially vulnerable or disadvantaged due to lockdown. And um, and thus the councils were able to take steps to address this issue. And finally, they also uh, mentioned that it was easier for the council to undertake public consultation and, and engagement. However, in addition to positive opportunities, the councils also uh, addressed some major problems that they encountered. The first of them being uh, some groups of citizens becoming especially vulnerable or disadvantaged to, to lockdown, for example, um, households in which uh, in which no um, uh, with no computers, so they were not able to access uh, the resources being made online, or issues of uh, lack of digital literacy. So even people who did have a computer in their household uh, were not able to access all the resources uh, available online. Other resources, um, other major problems could have been related to counselors not being used to communicating online or by video conferencing. So a double issue of both digital literacy, but also maybe digital etiquette, because having a meeting in person is not the same in terms of etiquette and best practices of having it online. Other issues uh, the respondents talked about related to changed, changes in working arrangements, so working from home, basically, and having to transition to online communication. Um, re in regards to this uh, aspect, we also asked a direct question about digital exclusion. So we asked uh, the, um, the, council, uh, the councils whether their council had taken active steps to tackle the, pro uh, the problem of digital exclusions. And almost 50% of them said yes. And interestingly, another 40, 42% said no because they were already tackling this issue. So it was already perceived as an issue. And 13% of them admitted that no, they didn't take any active step uh, and it still remained uh, a major problem for them. So 
this was a quick overview of the report and its main findings. Uh, again, as I've already mentioned, feel free to go over it in further detail, but I just wanted to give you an idea of the type of research that the Speaker's Corners Corner aims, aims to do. Another project I was involved in, it was a smaller uh, project um, that took place at Nottingham Speaker's Corner, right off Old Market Square, I think. And this was in collaboration with Soapbox Science. For those of you who don't know what it is, Soapbox Science is a scientific communication organization. So uh, 12 researchers um, uh, came and talked about their research. They were coming from physics, neuroscience, psychology, but also I think engineering and health science, if I recall correctly. And uh, the Speaker's Corner gave Soapbox Science the space to carry out this outreach event. The event took place almost one year ago now, so mid-July between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. And I remember walking around, going to talk to all the researchers, asking them whether they needed sunscreen. I, I left with a 10, but it was a very well-received event. We had about more than 750 people coming to visit the event completely um, by chance, completely at random, because they were just walking past. And I will show you in the next slide what the setup looked like. And um, most of the people who came and visited the event reported being uh, fascinated by, by, the, by the project. And um, personally, I think it would have been interesting, interesting to A, have maybe researchers from Leicester Uni. It was a shame that there were only researchers from, I think, Nottingham and, and Birmingham, and also maybe having a similar event in, in Leicester. So on the top left-hand side, of the screen, you can see what the event was like. So the researchers are wearing the white robes and are standing on the soap boxes. And you can see people walking past and stopping and listening to, to the research. And that was a very interesting event. And it also gave good publicity to the Nottingham Speakers, Speakers Corner. The last project I would like to, to tell you about is a project I was not directly involved in uh, that just finished, I think, at the beginning of this year, and it was the Young Speakers Grant that, uh, for, for Croydon. So the project was delivered between September 2022 and December 2022. All the recipients of these small grants received and signed a funding agreement before the release of the fund, and the agreement confirmed their commitment to delivering the project as described and producing a, a report. Um, unfortunately, only two out of the four grant recipients sent us back uh, a report, and I use this report to tell you a bit about what, what each of these small organizations uh, did with, with, uh, with their grant. So the first organization, um, overall, the, wait, sorry, I skipped, I skipped a couple of slides. I don't have the slides here. I don't know what happened. Apologies. Uh, but uh, these grants allowed the organizations to um, organize informal and formal debates involving primarily uh, young people in, uh, in Croydon, in various areas of Croydon, and young people reported being um, happy about taking part in these, in these debates. They were able to, to speak up and be listened to by more senior members of their community um, and some of them also reported their uh, interpersonal and communication skills being improved thanks to taking part in these in this informal projects. Again, I was not directly involved in it, but I would be more than happy to provide more information after I've spoken to the, um, uh, to the trustee who was directly involved in carrying out and supervising this project. Overall, um, the Board of Trustees agreed that the main objective of this uh, grant was achieved. So they gave the, um, they gave the um, organizations the opportunity to invest in the Croydon community, focusing on the people. Um, young people benefited from these small grants. However, unfortunately, only half of the grant recipients reported back. But all in all, um, the Board of Trustees agreed that it was a great initiative that we all believe could be replicated and built upon, focusing on different aspects or focusing, focusing on different parts um, of, the, of the country. 
which brings me to uh, my last and final slide, um, where I tell you basically that we are currently uh, looking for new patrons and new trustees, allowing us to branch into different areas of expertise, allowing us to address different types of stakeholders. For example, given that I work at the university, I am currently helping with grant writing. We are interested uh, in carrying out research uh, on the role of conversation in mental well-being for different age groups. So in case you were wondering how you can get involved or even just how can you know more about the Speakers Corner Trust, we are looking for new patrons, we are looking for new trustees, we are looking for different ways to uh, branch out and contact different types of stakeholder, uh, stakeholders. Um, we have a, um, a website, speakerscornertrust.org, that is currently undergoing refurbishment, I think, but you can find much more information about who we are and what we do and our past projects. Um, we also have a Twitter account uh, that we should probably make more active, but it's there. And if you want to write to me directly, I also have a Twitter handle and I also have a personal website that, where you can see what I do when I am not uh, a Speaker's Corner trustee. So uh, I mostly wanted to give this talk to showcase who you are and what you do and help you start thinking maybe how I, how can I know more about the uh, mm, charity and how I can get involved with them. Um, that's all from me. Thank you all very much for listening. I will be more than happy to answer any question or curiosity you may have about the trust. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Marta. Um, such an informative talk, lots of, of stuff going on, lots of community engagement to, to be very proud of. Um, and I think particularly with the kind of freedom of speech aspect of it from the council side, there's a lot of things um, that people went through in the pandemic that they can very much relate to. There's some comments in the chat um, from people working in local council saying, you know, video conferencing was not a positive uh, because they're not allowed to make, um, not allowed by law to make decisions in person. So obviously that wouldn't have worked for their area. Whereas other people, like you said, found it really, really engaging. Um, so it was oh and I didn't know about the the award that you guys won last year so congratulations on that it's really really great we were nominated but it's still something still something yeah <laughs> um it was really um oh I also wanted to say um that Louise is in the chat and has just popped a comment in so it sounds oh. like a really great supportive team that you're working with so really really nice to hear um it was fascinating for me to see that meeting go viral, uh, that Zoom meeting when it did, um, and to just get a little snapshot into to how these things kind of work. Yeah. Um, but I mean, did you have any personal opinions? Obviously you've done all the research into that, what happened and kind of the perspective on that and things like that, but just with that Zoom viral call, do you have any personal perspective on it? I think that it really showed um, the issue of digital literacy because it can be hard if you're not used to using um, digital technology to uh, not only familiarize with it in no time, but then to actually try and have a productive talk and try and make decisions if you have never done it before. I just remember there was another video that went viral of I think it was a lawyer who activated like a cat filter so he was in an important meeting but he was having a cat filter on his face and again now we don't really think much of it because we spent three years having hybrid meetings or online meetings only so I think that maybe added an extra on one hand it helped uh, due to all the reasons I showed you so being able to have higher attendance but on the other hand um, if it is, if these meetings also involved people who didn't have such a high level of digital literacy, I can see why it could have been an obstacle for them and why it could have prevented them from being more engaged in, the, in their council or maybe even like senior citizens being told, no, you have to do everything online and they barely know how to access their email if they even have an email. So I can see the benefit as a young person, but I can also see the learning curve that it might have forced some, um, onto some people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it would be interesting maybe to have a follow-up 
Uh, this was an externally funded project. So we haven't carried out any follow-up, but it would be very interesting for me to see two years after whether any council made any change that stuck or they went back to doing everything in person or a mix of the two. So that would be personally very interesting to, to explore and to understand. Yeah, and I guess it brings into, um, oh yeah, sorry, my colleagues, I was just put, um, about putting any questions you have in the chat for Marta, so please do. Um, but I guess it brings into question as well around the kind of ethics of it, because yeah. uh, in the viral video, obviously, they, the, the kind of secretary or the chair, I can't remember who, who she was, kind of kicked someone out of the meeting. And it's like, if that was in person, would that necessarily have happened? So maybe yeah. there's something around that. I yeah. think there was an issue. I mean, it was not anonymous because you could see their faces, but it's not the same at having people there in person. And I remember the very first times we were having online meetings, even for the university. Sometimes you would get people who have nothing to do with the meeting, who still managed to get inside it one way or another. You can't really, I don't think that has happened anytime recently, that was again another issue you had to keep into account when uh, organizing these types, this type of of events. Okay, great. Um, I'm just gonna have a look at the questions. Um, if you're happy to stop sharing your screen, we can do a bit more. Yeah. We'll look at the screen, but that's yeah. fine. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we've got a couple coming in. Okay. Um, so obviously, our audience are all amazing Leicester alumni. Um, so do you have any thoughts about what Leicester as a city, but also Leicester University as an institution can kind of contribute to what you're doing? Obviously, you said there's kind of look out for trustees and things like that, but yeah. maybe with the kind of the research side that you found, did it spare any ideas yeah. about Leicester itself? Um, for example, when we started thinking about this project on the role of conversation on mental health, given that I work in psychology, I was already thinking of... Um, of people that I could reach out to, but I'm still trying to figure out who is going to be our target audience, because I know that some people are mostly working with elderly, some other people are mostly working with children or adolescents. So we have a very good psychology department, maybe I'm biased because I'm working it. So it would be very interesting for me to further develop the, these connections. Also maybe at a more informal level, as I mentioned that at the Nottingham, um, uh, so box science, I couldn't find anyone from Leicester. Again, it was a completely different uni organizing it, but we are not that far from Nottingham. And I, I see no reason why we couldn't do something similar. Also because we were talking about, Kelly and I were talking about it before we, we got into the call that I think one of the first times Kelly and I met was at a soapbox science event. So this has been done at Leicester. And I see no reason why we couldn't do that. And maybe Louise knows more about it, but like years even before I came here to the UK even probably in the early 2000s or before that we did have a speaker's corner branch here at Leicester mm -hmm. and maybe someone from the council knows about it or someone who was here as, a, as an alumnus knows about it so I can't see any reason why we could not bring that uh, bring that back yeah it was part of um Riverside Festival at one point. As I well. remember that. No, that yeah. that was soapbox science because I remember oh, right, some yeah. colleagues. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that too. Cool. Um. So, say obviously you said there's opportunities to get involved, um, and you kind of touched on that. So, do you want to just cover that again? That if anyone in our audience is interested in in getting involved, is there anything? They yeah, can no, do? definitely. Um, we are looking for. I mean, I don't know whether Louise is still in the call and would like to. Uh, say more about the 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 type of uh, trustees and patrons we are interested in talking to or even like informal chat just to understand better what we're currently doing and whether and how people might be uh, interested in in supporting us even on an informal level um, because we are currently relying on personal connections obviously which is why I am speaking to colleagues at the at the university um, Sorry, I was a bit distracted because I was looking at the last question. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to come on to a couple of them in a second. So I've just got okay. a few more to go through. Um, what was this? Oh, this one was about, um, so yeah, we did put the link in the chat to um, okay. the report. Um, how, when did you start the research? Like, how did it come about? Was it, was it kind of 
straight into the pandemic? Was it a, like kind of a year in? How did it all, all come together? Um, I got in touch with Louise, I think it was end of 2020. And mm -hmm. then we started because I think they got a grant from David's Roundtree in second, like third trimester of 2020 or so. Um, we started collecting the data in um, February or March 2021. So we were still fully in lockdown, at least. I was still working mm -hmm. from home for the university. So we were still fully in lockdown, but it had almost been one year. And we thought that would be a good time because that had been the state of things for quite some time. So we were expecting councils and people to have started to get used to it or adapted to it one way, one way or another. So yeah, this was, uh, let's say February, March, 2020. And we finished the report in the summer of the same year. Okay, great. So yeah, which is why I was thinking it would be interesting to have a follow-up like two years after. Yeah, and on that, um, you know, I think a few people have kind of acknowledged that, you know, some of the stats were like 45%. So you're almost kind of not hitting a 50-50 split, but you're kind yeah. of getting very split opinion on things. So obviously, when councils kind of came out of the pandemic, do you know if they were just kind of left to make the decision? And, you know, it was a very free decision to go, OK, we're going to go hybrid or we're going to go fully online or we're going to go physical. Um, because obviously that will leave quite a, an inconsistent approach. So yeah, yeah, do you have any comments about that? About what um, the, the kind of freedom that councils have to then decide what they what they progress with? I can't speak on that to be honest. I don't know, but I was also thinking that maybe the same people are not even there anymore. So maybe I would be sp speaking to someone who was not in the council, so they can tell me the same thing. I don't know why we <clears throat> made this decision because I was not the person in charge of making the, the decision. So even having a follow-up, yeah, they would still be speaking on behalf of, let's say, Leicester City Council, but maybe they are completely different people. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. So yeah, going back to the, the couple of questions that come through in the chat, uh, there was a mention that two of the recipients of the grants did the right thing and told you what they did with the money and how it benefited people. Um, so what about the other two recipients that didn't kind of get back in touch? Do you have any comments around that? Um, I know that the trustee who was in charge of supervising the project uh, sent them multiple follow-ups, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think anything more than that was done. I think this is a good time maybe for uh, Louise to pitch in if she has more um, better quality information about it than me, given that she's uh, the chair. Uh, Louise, do come in if you can. Yeah. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I was just waiting for you to, 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 to finish your brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you. To put, to put things in context here is that this particular piece of research was indeed funded by the Joseph Roundtree SST Charitable Trust. Those of you who know Joseph Roundtree Trust very much advocates of democracy, civil society, open debate. And we, we have um, approached them again to see if we can do some follow-up work. Because if you remember, you know, three years ago when we did this, uh, we were all of us in very interesting situations. And what prompted me to contact them was my concern that our cities and our public realms and spaces where we could gather to debate, to discuss in person, which is what Speakers Corner is about, were simply shut down. The streets emptied and there was nowhere that we could go to voice our concerns. From that moment of, of concern, and I started conversations with those, uh, not only at the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust, but also in Westminster, we moved our thinking towards this particular piece of research so we could be very specific, working very closely, not only with the councils that Marta has mentioned, but also the, the, the local democracy reporters, and that contract is actually managed by REACH PLC and the BBC. So we're talking about some very significant contribu contributors here to this piece of research, hence the fact that we, we were nominated and indeed were shortlisted for that award. Just to remind you all that Speaker's Corner Trust started in 2008 by a former MP who believed it very important, as I think your, the questioner says in the chat, very important that it is far better for people to come together to agree, to disagree, agreeably in person 
in the public realm. So you saw Speaker's Corner um, at, in Nottingham, where I've spoken on many occasions and where no doubt there's a vigil tonight for the tragic scenario that's happening, has happened in Nottingham. So a Speaker's Corner can be used by anybody within a certain code of practice, which is to be respectful of those who are speaking, equally respectful though of those who are listening and speaking. And the idea really is to try to get back to some kind of civility in our debate and discussions across each other. Um, and that is its fundamental premise. There is indeed, there was indeed a committee running a Leicester Speaker's Corner, as there was in 15 other cities. However, what we found was it became almost unsustainable as voluntary committees moved on or retired. The Litchfield Speaker's Corner, which is fabulous, which is in the shadow of Litchfield Cathedral, is still there and is very much used and loved by the citizens of Litchfield. It doesn't need a committee to run it anymore. So as a small charity, we have pulled back from setting up more physical corners, which are very time consuming. And as Marta has described, we now have these three pillars of work. Advocacy, which is this national work and where possible to get involved with parliament and government and those who we can influence. Secondly, the debates and working very closely. One of our trustees works for the Tony Blair Institute. The Institute is very keen to start running some online debates with us. And then of course the educate. Now, in answer to your question about the two community projects that didn't respond in Croydon, hands up any of you who have ever tried to run and work with very tiny organizations who are meaning well and they do wonderful work. And we didn't give them a lot of money by the way. So we're not a soft touch. We were testing the waters with this project. And sure enough, we got a 50% response rate. Well, actually, in my mind, that's actually not bad. Um, fortunately, the trustee does know these organizations, so they didn't run off with the money. And I truly believe they probably did some good work. But we're learning. We're learning from this. And yes, they did actually sign a contract as well. No, we didn't threaten to take the money back. But we have to be simply honest and, and, and open about how we're trying to try to work in a very difficult scenario with 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 community groups. But but thank you for your interest. And, and Marta, thank you so much for your, your contribution. There's a wider picture here around uh, what's happening with the COVID-19 uh, inquiry at the moment, because I truly believe that our research report should be looked at by the inquiry, because I believe it does ask, ask questions about how councils were able to deliver de democratic services during COVID. Um, please read the report because there's lots in it for you to learn from if you're interested in this area. But I truly believe that we have a lot to do in terms of maintaining and upholding solid democracy, good leadership, politicians who are willing to be humble and listen to the electorate. Uh, we don't want to get too involved politically, but in terms of patrons, I would honestly say to you that we are looking at the likes of Rory uh, Stewart and, and, and Alistair Campbell, we, we have wonderful patrons lined up already who truly believe in what we're doing. And even though we're a small charity, we really have got some big aims. So, sorry for my speech, but I hope that's put some context behind the wonderful work that my trustees are, are helping, helping us all to do. And um, yeah, I mean, honestly, thank you um, for your questions as well. And I'm here till seven. <laughs> Thanks so much, Louise. It's good to put like a face in the name and see all the work that you guys are helping with. So we'll bring it back to Martin and we'll bring it a little bit back to the research again, if that's OK. And yeah. um, we've got some questions and some comments, so we're just going to go through them. Um, so someone said, I find online meetings much more difficult than in person, which I'm sure a lot of people do. Uh, you cannot see people's reactions or desire to speak so easily. How do we get over this? Is it easier to get a proper agreement in person? So it's quite a, a big um, question to speak about. So it's your personal kind of opinion. But it is true, you know, you don't get that kind of energy when you're when you're online as you do with someone in the same room. So do you have thoughts around that? I think I also someone was saying uh not really the opposite um yeah where someone else was saying that they believe that um too much content and document and approval processes are on physical paper so 
I don't think there is a clear cut answer. A yeah. is the best way, B is the best way. Um, for example, I didn't know that you can't make decisions unless it is in person. And I don't know whether that's like a council specific law or rule that I, am made, that I had made up because it, I refuse to believe that for one and a half years, the council did not make any decision. They might have found a way, uh, a way around it. Uh, the said, I mean, from my background, I could say that maybe it's also a cultural thing, but maybe in person, sometimes you can also see others' nonverbal language, for example, and it's not that easy to do the same thing in, in an online setting, also because people can just like turn their camera off and you have no idea who you're talking to, their expression, their uh, intentions, their um, intonation of their tone of voice, but I can also clearly see the benefits of it. So I I would tend to agree with both sides saying like too much paperwork, it's we could we should try and make things um, more and more simple. But I can also think of maybe my grandma would rather have a hard copy of all of her like, I don't know, medical tests or whatever, rather than having to learn how to use a digital, a digital system. So yeah. And I think um, there was also this, they termed um, something Zoom fatigue, didn't they? Where people were purely exhausted, didn't want to do it anymore. And obviously, you know, that can be severely demotivating if it's for your work. And then it gave people the kind of freedom to say, no, I prefer to be in a room to have this conversation or this chat. And provided that everybody was in kind of alignment with that, then that's how people have, some some people have decided to move forward. But then there's also this conversation of hybrid um, meeting so I, I I'm a I'm a fan of ever anything and everything really mm-hmm. but I was in a hybrid meeting just yesterday and it was a it felt slightly chaotic more um, often than not yet it t- yeah. ended up being quite chaotic yeah <laughs> um so if anyone um in the audience has kind of opinions on hybrid meetings do pop them in the chat um, I was thinking I have this anecdotal episode I think someone I can't remember whether we even put it in the report or not but they were saying my whole work is in front of a computer I like having in-person meetings because at least it's a change of pace from my day-to-day activity so that's also an interesting point of view that said if someone has caregiving uh, duties they might say no I want to be able to be from home so again unfortunately or Maybe it's for the best. There is no clear cut yeah. uh, way to to say this is the way we should be going. There's so many variables of that, isn't there? You yeah. know, you prefer online, prefer not, prefer both, but kind of sometimes prefer online other weeks. Yeah. So yeah, so many barriers. Um, we've got a lovely comment here that says, thank you for the session. I was elected city councillor last month and find the, the narrative of democracy has changed to some extent. So uh, thank you for being informative. Yeah. Um, there's a comment just for thank you, Louise. Full talk context is very helpful. Carry on the good work. Um, and then there's quite a large uh, yeah. comment. I don't know if you just want to scan through it. Um, I was wondering, have you spoken with local councils or local councils that you perform research with with regards to having all of their council meetings recorded and posted online? So this is really, really interesting, actually, because I didn't know that these things could be posted online until the one went viral. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, do you have any comments around that? I know it's quite a biggie in terms of the comment, but thoughts? I can't remember whether we had specific questions about that, to be to be honest, because I think we mostly focus on the... I don't know how how can I say not really on the internal work but I can't remember having a specific question on would you like your decision making process to be made available to 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 everyone also because I I'm thinking in some instances maybe it's it's greener to be online sorry I just like see the the notifications yeah it is greener to be to be online Mm. um I guess you know, if people know it's being recorded, are they going to act in the same way? Yes. They feel like they yeah. can say what they want to say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good. I mean, even without being recorded, you always had someone who was taking minutes and notes, mm-hmm. but it's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like minutes and notes are still being filtered through a, another person, whereas a recording, you can't lie your way out of a, you can't negotiate your way back from from our recording so I can also see that side of things Uh Um, yeah I don't 
I don't know whether there's anyone who is in a in a city council who would like to to maybe mention how they are doing things now, but because I don't have any any direct expertise or experience with how these things work, I can only say that the hybrid meetings we are having at the at the university oftentimes they go the wrong way because the IT system is not working properly or the room is not ideal. Yeah, if anybody wants to put any comments in the chat, then please do for Marta. Uh, we'll just take a couple more minutes of uh, chat. Um, just to go back to it's greener to be online, which is a very valid point. It's yeah. a very important point. Um, and also I've seen meetings where there's QR codes for the papers. So rather oh. than having a kind yeah. of pack, you kind of go on to that. But again, you know, if your technology fails, then are you left without papers in front of you? Um, so again, so many variables. Um, so someone said, I love hybrid meetings. If the meeting are properly planned, is properly planned, and um, so interactions can be captured and those online included, audio and video should be of the highest quality so you can see and hear everyone um, if you're online. So yeah, again, you know, it, it works if it works. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe now we are better prepared for it because we are two or three years in, but at the very beginning, we all had to make the switch. So maybe people, when they set up their work, like um, their home office, they were not planning, they would be spending eight hours having online meetings. So they're like, yeah, this this will do, this camera, this microphone will do for whatever I need to do on a whim, but they were, you couldn't rely on them to have reliable. So yeah, that's a very fair point. When the technology is fi works fine, they can go very well, but there is so many different issues, like even maybe uh, households with a, with a poor connection or maybe households who shared one single computer for the whole family and maybe the the counselor or the person who needs the computer for uh, for the meeting or for the call needs to do it to give it to their children or to their to their son or whatever because they have to do to make to do homework again this can still happen to me it sounds like uh, it would never happen to me but it could happen to me maybe my partner and I are sharing one computer and need it for a very important meeting but it tells me I need it for whatever reason I need to do or like the um, broadband speed so many variables you can only control up to a certain extent mm -hmm. yeah definitely and um, we'll start to, to kind of bring this to a close so if anyone has any final questions do um, pop them in the chat now um, but I just wanted to bring it back to kind of health and well-being. So obviously yeah. you mentioned it um, and kind of Louise mentioned it as well. But did you, can you just touch upon that again in terms of what you found in terms of the research or or in Speaker's Corner, things like that? Um, so, yeah, we have this grant writing project. Where we wanted to understand how we can basically put together the uh, Speaker's Corner Trust expertise and main area of interest, which is like public speaking and talking. and uh, um, mental well-being because we've noticed that sometimes people do not have the words to talk about their um, well-being so helping them find their voice and finding find the words and make it less of a taboo topic so mm -hmm. that's the direction in which we are uh, planning to go again I don't know if Louise still has 10 minutes or so to to pitch in so I think we've become aware of um, what's being termed by a number of, of teachers as sort of social anxiety across students in, in pupil, pupils and, and indeed students in universities and elsewhere. So the, the, the thinking that we know that social prescribing is very common now for, um, for gardening, for walking, for singing, it's all good for us to do these activities that are somehow cerebrally different or physically different. And um, I know that sort of chat tables in pubs or there, there are all sorts of projects around the world now that, that bring people to just together in community. And if we can't do that in the public realm, a, a public square like a speaker's corner, can we do it somewhere else? And what difference might it, might it make? And how might it bring us together with each other to, to discuss simplest, simplest of things to try to understand each other better or just to have a chat. Uh, so we'll be exploring that with some of the grant giving bodies and foundations who again are particularly interested in that in that whole area. Uh, but it's very early days if anybody on this 
Paul has got any connections, any interest in this particular piece of research, it will be our research for 2023, 24, it would be fabulous. Amazing, thank you, you heard it here first. Um, just a comment from Nadine, should we all seek in similar research in the councils in our own country? So obviously we do, as you can see in the chat, we've got people from all over the world in this chat, which is wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, can this become global in the scope by engaging some of us with the instrument you use to do the research shared here? So yeah, could this go global in terms of research? If we have the funding, yes. <laughs> But there's potential say say in an ideal world we could with we partners could. with partners in other parts of the country we, yeah. we did start a, a speaker's corner in nigeria actually some years oh. ago but uh, I, i'm afraid i'm not quite sure what its status is yet is 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 at the moment again it's uh yeah but obviously there's a conversation to be how it to be carried on then through marta yeah amazing so yeah again might have heard it here first um so thank you both to louise and to especially to Martha. thank you so much for taking the time and um, we'll start to close up the session now um and obviously Martha did put her um contact details in in yeah. the presentation as well if anybody wants to carry on the conversation it's been incredible it's been wonderful to talk to you Martha I know I've known you for a few years so to see this progress has been really really wonderful um so yeah just a couple of little admin bits Elle my colleague has just popped into the chat um our website for future events and also um our kind of feedback form and um, feedback filling out the, the evaluation form will help us improve our events in the future so please please do take some time to do that um, but we'll also send a follow up email for you to, to have a view of that as well. Um, thank you so much to everyone attending. We appreciate it. Um, again, thank you so much to everybody around the world who's taken the time to, to tune in because we know that there's obviously some different time differences. Um, to keep on point, we have recorded this <laughs> um, and we will publish it on the website within the next kind of couple of weeks, should you wish to share it or, or rewatch. Um, and yeah, we're going to keep the meeting. Um, that, that's the end of the event, but we will keep the meeting a couple of um, minutes live just to give you the opportunity to, to do the form if you wish to, or to just take some time to, to kind of head out. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us and take care. Thanks, Marta. Thank you. Thank you Bye, very everyone. much to everyone. Thank Bye. you.